And my pleasure is it to introduce uh, my colleague, Sarah Marcy, who um, has a background in maths and psychology and did her um, PhD in epigenetics and statistical genetics here at King's and now has started her own research lab at Imperial. And she's going to talk about the epigenetics of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, finally managed to unmute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and it's uh, very nice to be back at King's, at least virtually, for this uh, talk. Let me start sharing my slides. Um, go. And here we are. Uh, excellent. Um, Okay, so this is a story, sort of a saga that has been evolving since uh, the days of my PhD, and it's about dysregulation of histone acetylation in Alzheimer's disease. And so very much goes into what my new lab at Imperial College within the UK Dementia Research Institute is um, focused about as well. Um, I am looking at Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and at epigenetic regulators that are consequences of genetic risk variants, but also environmental risk factors. Um, so, okay, just to set the stage, when I talk about epigenetic regulation, I use a relatively lenient definition. So I call anything that's a biochemical mechanism giving rise to changes in gene regulation epigenetic, and it requires a certain level of stability um, and heritability. So um, what I really mean by this is um, what many people mean, um, these three mechanisms, DNA modifications, most prevalently DNA methylation, modifications to the histone tails, uh, and non-coding RNA. Um, now, I don't need to convince this audience, I think, that Alzheimer's disease is a very highly heritable disease. Um, and in fact, as part of this consortium and other efforts, lots of uh, risk variants are already being identified from large scale GWAS. So, for example, one of the recent ones here, Conkle et al. Um, but unfortunately, uh, assigning consequences and functions to these variants is often very tricky because they tend to be non-coding and rather fall into regulatory regions. So it's a bit unclear um, which genes they regulate and what they do downstream. And this is where I think epigenetics comes in and can tell us a lot about uh, functional consequences of genetic risk variants. Um, so the particular epigenetic modification that I decided to look at was um, H3K27 acetyl. This is a histone modification. And like all acetylation uh, marks on histones, it's correlated with uh, relaxed chromatin and more active transcriptional states. But specifically, um, it's found at active promoters and enhancers. Um, it tends to be relatively independent of other histone marks. So adding an extra layer of any information you may have collected earlier already uh, importantly, it shows inter-individual variation because if you want to do an epidemiological study um, on, uh, on a mark, uh, there should be some variation in the population. Um, and interestingly, in the context of Alzheimer's disease, um, histone modifiers, histone acetylation modifiers, are amongst the currently most promising target drugs of AD. So the way you study this is with chromatin immunoprecipitation. Uh, and we started with um, human brain samples, snap frozen tissue um, from a brain bank, 24 cases, 23 controls, uh, looking at the entorhinal cortex, which is the first and most severely affected um, area in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the way chromatin immunoprecipitation works is you basically fish out DNA fragments that interact with your histone modification of interest. So you will fish out all the histones that have H3K24. Uh, seven acetyl, um, and then sequence the pieces of DNA that were interacting with those histones, um, align them, map them out, and then you get these little regions here that look like mountains, so they're called peaks, um, and thereby you define your regions of interest. From there on, it's very much like studying gene expression data, just that rather than a transcript or a gene, um, your region of interest, your peak is empirically defined from your data. Um, and so when we did all this and we looked for differences between cases and controls, um, we found quite a large number of differences at FDR um, threshold uh, with notably more down-regulated peaks than uh, up-regulated peaks, so with lower acetylation in Alzheimer's uh, than in controls. 
Um, and uh, just a highlight of one of the things that we saw was um, we found this hyperacetylation peak upstream of uh, MAPT, so that's tau, the gene encoding for tau protein. Um, and that was among the top hits. And this is quite interesting because um, tau, when it becomes high, hyperphosphorylated and, and forms these tangles, is one of the, the two main neuropathological hallmarks of the disease. And so when we zoomed in a bit more, we actually found that it wasn't just one peak here that was dysregulated, um, but a whole group of six peaks that were upstream of the gene. Um, so here's tau right here. Uh, and this is this cluster of peaks. Um, and when we checked out epigenetic annotation um, from a range of other tissues from the roadmap consortium, we saw that this is a very brain specific peak. So all these peaks appear in all the brain samples from roadmap, but not really um, in any of the non-brain tissues we compared it to. And the same was also reflected with regards to chromatin state. So using chromum HMM for chromatin state annotation, we saw that our peaks largely corresponded to um, enhancers um, in brain tissue, um, but really repressed or quiescent states uh, in non-brain related tissues. Um, and we, we had a similar case of a whole enhancer cluster upstream of presenilin 2, and uh, so those were both quite striking. Um, we also looked for how this um, interacted with genetic signals, and this was an analysis led by Eilish Hannon at the University of Exeter, um, where we saw that AD heritability, and this was using the Lambert et al. meta-analysis data, was enriched in enterinal cortex H3K27 cetyl peaks, but also other brain-related um, phenotypes showed enriched heritability in these peaks, um, and even some that are not necessarily obviously brain-related, um, like smoking or BMI, but that may, may have um, behavioral or central nervous system components. Um, did some gene ontology analysis and saw some in interesting things come up here, so including apolipoprotein binding, so APOE um, obviously being the biggest single genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and, and this uh, slightly outdated name, PICS disease, and now called frontotemporal dementia, but in the ontology uh, still with this old name. Um, we also did some gene expression work on a selected number of genes that had come out of our analyses and some, some that were known from um, familial AD or ADG was before. And for a number of them found significant differences in expression um, that were consistent in the direction as predicted by the acetylation. But um, these were not all the genes we tested and for some it just didn't um, show any expression differences. All right, so up to this point, this is the old work. This has been published, um, so you can read it all up. Um, just to summarize, this for the first study of H3K27 acetyl in AD, there were widespread differences in acetylation, and we were able to integrate this with genetic gene expression and DNA modification data and show a potential link between familial and sporadic Alzheimer's disease pathways because the genes that are known to cause the familial types were heavily uh, dysregulated epigenetically here. But I would say the, the biggest main caveat of this work is that the brain is a very heterogeneous tissue uh, and using whole brain samples, you'll, you get a mix of different cell types. And so using very recently published work, um, you can now look at uh, purified cell type epigenetic state. So unfortunately, um, Unlike RNA-seq and ATTACK-seq, which are already uh, at scale available for single cell profiling, this is not so much the case for histone modifications yet, but you can fax sort um, brain samples into, in, into individual cell types and then look at epigenetics. And uh, this is some beautiful work led by Alexi Knott uh, in Chris Glass's lab at UCSD. Uh, where they used uh, resected tissue from epilepsy surgeries and sorted out four main brain cell types, oligodendrocytes, microglia, neurons, and astrocytes, um, and profiled them uh, for a number of histone modifications, including H3K27 acetyl. And when they find um, some, some obvious things, so as, as was known before, promoters tend to be a lot more conserved across cell types, whereas enhancers are really quite highly cell type specific. And they, with this data, they were able to capture 94% of known psych encode bulk brain enhancers. So uh, really the majority of those are lie in those four cell types. Um, they also did some interesting cell type specific um, 
enrichment analyses for genomic regulatory regions. Um, and uh, now you're all going to get excited about this part, I think. But um, of course, with AD, I was interested in, in the left here. Um, and what they showed, and others have shown this, and I think Julian, who's going to talk later, has shown this with um, single cell RNA-seq as well. So that um, AD heritability is um, strongly enriched in microglia. And in fact, they pinpointed to microglial enhancers. Um, OK, so I thought I can use this data because this comes from a very small data set and this is all neuropathology free. I have a large, for epigenetics, large data set. Um, can I annotate my peaks with this cell type specific information? So here, just an overview, how many peaks were there in Alexi's data? How many peaks can I recover in bulk? And as you can see, that's upwards of 50% um, for each of these cell types are actually present in my bulk data. And then more interestingly, how many of my peaks can I assign to a specific single cell type? Um, and, and this is how many for each cell type. So um, from 9,000 in astrocytes to almost 40,000 in neurons. And if I go a bit more leniently and I allow two annotations for a cell type, I can increase that even more. All right, so what I next did uh, is I annotated my differentially acetylated peaks with the cell type annotation. So this is now restricted only to cell types that were annotatable. There were about 25%, 24% that didn't have any annotation from the not at all data. Um, but this is what the picture looks like. And I can look at our certain cell types specifically enriched in the sets that are hyperacetylated, so upregulated in AD or downregulated. Um, and I see certain things all over the place. So red is enriched here, blue is depleted, maybe less interesting. Um, but I see some oligodendrocyte um, coming up in the upregulated peaks, neurons in the downregulated peaks maybe also some astrocytes in the upregulated peaks. But this has another caveat, because of course the original analysis is still confounded by cell type composition effects because it was conducted on the bulk. And so if there are differences in composition between the samples, um, that would have not been accounted for. We did account for neuronal proportions as estimated on DNA methylation, but none of the other cell types. So I had the idea that I can use the cell type specific peaks to estimate or find a proxy for cellular composition. And, and this relies on the assumption that AD related differences in acetylation are only going to affect a minority of cell type specific peaks. So that if I average across all of them for a single cell type, I'll get um, a, a proxy um, for how prevalent that cell type is. Um, and so the idea is generate a score, cell type score, if you will, for each individual and each cell type where I take an average of some um, signal standardized signal intensity measure um, across all the cell type specific peaks. Um, and I set, set the, um, the caveat on this that each signal intensity, so all the peaks are worth equal amounts. So the maximum signal for any peak and any person can be one. Um, so I'm averaging numbers between zero and one, I'll get a score between zero and one for all samples. And this works quite nicely. And so, for example, the, the acetylation neuronal score correlates with the DNA methylation score. Um, and some other things are reassuring neuronal ligodendrocyte negatively correlated as the two most prevalent uh, cell types, that makes sense, uh, and microglials and astrocytes positively correlated. Um, furthermore, the microglia and astrocyte scores also correlated with um, expression of marker genes for those two cell types. Uh, and if this looks negative, this is because DNA, uh, the, the expression was me measured negatively as delta CT, so higher expression with uh, lower delta CT. Um, and I can look at differences in cell type proportions between cases and controls, for example, and um, across um, acetylation scores and gene expression of marker genes, what I see is as expected, neurons uh, go down in disease. It's a neurodegenerative disease. And all the other cell types seem to go up as a consequence of neurons, of course, disappearing, but also potentially um, in response to inflammatory um, phenotypes there. And so the final thing uh, that I'm going to show you is so I repeated the differential acetylation analysis, now controlling for my uh, cell type scores based on acetylation data. And now the picture starts to change a little bit. And um, I was a bit surprised to see that um, the only enriched category, both in the hyper and hypoacetylated peaks, are oligodendrocytes. And this was sort of, I would have expected microglia, given all the genetic things we know. And I'm not sure what to make of it yet. But in fact, it is consistent with a paper, a preprint that just came out um, 
few weeks ago that has done cell type specific histone acetylation differences between Alzheimer's cases and controls. And they also find that oligodendrocytes are um, by far the most enriched category um, and show the biggest differences between cases and controls in both directions, up and down regulated. So with that, uh, I'm going to close. Uh, I'd like to thank a lot of people that have been involved uh, in this over the time and also new lab members and collaborators at Imperial, some of the core people here highlighted in bold. A um, bit embarrassed to say I don't have a new lab picture yet, so I picked uh, this one that we uh, took for our 50 miles in 50 days Parkinson's challenge. So if you have some spare change, um, could do consider donating to this fantastic charity. Um, and I'm also going to be recruiting postdocs and technicians very soon, so do get in touch. Thank you, Sarah. This was wonderful. Um, uh, the attendees can ask questions via the Q&A. So currently, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, no question. So um, Mike Gendel actually has a question for you. So, are the MAPT acetylation changes associated with any known genetic risk factors in the gene? Um, no, so we didn't um, look for the actual variants in these samples and the acetylation. But what I can tell you is that um, I've looked up their oligodendrocyte specific peaks, uh, surprisingly, again. Um, and they may not be regulating MAPT. So um, we didn't see differences in MAPT expression um, between cases and control. So while they're upstream of MAPTs, and so we were sort of inclined to think they are likely to have a function with that, it doesn't look like they are regulating MAPT. 